All right. Sure. So um, my name is Torin Clark. I'm an assistant professor in aerospace engineering, uh, and I'm going to talk about sort of a hodgepodge of various related research projects, um, all related to this thing called galvanic vestibular stimulation that I'll, I'll introduce. So if you've never heard of this, that's totally fine. Uh, and various ways that uh, galvanic vestibular stimulation, or probably throughout the rest of the presentation, I'll call it GVS because I'll never be able to get through saying that too many times, how GVS can affect how humans perceive um, their themselves and, and where they, how they're moving in the environment and where they are in the environment. So I imagine um, oops, that folks maybe are not super familiar with the vestibular system. Um, so I'll introduce it with this fun video. Uh, so I'll start playing this video. Hopefully it works out okay. And talk through oh, the volume's not too obnoxious. Okay. Um, so as background, the vestibular system is in our inner ear and it senses self motion. And particularly in animals, they use this for something called the vestibular colic reflex. Uh, vestibular colic reflex, which helps them stabilize their head in space. And this is important for animals because you want your eyes to be stable in space because otherwise when your eyes move around, the world will move around on your retina and it'll be really hard to distinguish anything. So uh, chickens have a really good, strong vestibular colic reflex. Um, so this is an experiment or a, a commercial, I think it came out probably like eight or 10 years ago, Mercedes commercial, um, basically saying that their suspension systems were similar to, I guess, the uh, vestibular uh, colic reflex of <clears throat> chickens. So um, what's going on here, right, is the vestibular system located in the inner ear sort of acts as um, an inertial measurement unit. It can sense gravity and linear acceleration uh, and angular velocity and can use that to estimate where the head, in this case of the chicken, is uh, in space. So as it moves around, even if a person you know, that's holding a chicken moves the chicken around, the chicken can know where its head is and can act activate uh, motor control, movement control to keep the head stable in space. Um, so the vestibular system, as I'll talk about here, has two components, the semicircular canals and the otoliths, um, but it's not the only system that helps us sense our own motion in space. We also use visual cues, right? When you are sitting in a car and the car next to you moves and you feel like you're going backwards, that sense of action uh, is due to the visual uh, sensors giving you a sensation that you're moving backwards, right? In this case, in that case, it's an illusory perception, but um, you know, in normal life, that's how we can, you know, know where we are in a room and as we walk towards the door, now we're getting closer to the door or something like that. Um, we also use things like uh, proprioception, somatosensory, tactile cues, and even auditory cues. Right? When you, um, if you're staying still and you hear someone walk by you, um, or if you're sitting on a chair and you rotate the chair and someone's talking, you can get a cue that you've rotated because the stationary auditory source um, sounds like, you know, it's moving relative to you. So all these cues go into our brain and our brain integrates them to estimate uh, our own orientation perception and then control our own movement, right? It really enables everyday functional life. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail on this, but the, maybe the takeaway that I want you to think of is there's some secret canals sort of act like a gyroscope. They sense more or less angular velocity uh, and your otoliths more or less act as a, a linear accelerometer and that they sense linear acceleration, but just like, it, you know, uh, uh, engineering or a physical accelerometer, they also sense gravity. So they actually sense the combination of gravity and linear acceleration, which is the gravito inertial acceleration. And, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's a little bit of background. Um, just sort of give you give you a sense here, right? Everyone says you have five senses. I've, I have little kids and every TV show tells you that you have five senses. Uh, that's not true. You have somewhere people have uh, different uh, scientists have different views on this, but somewhere between 20 and 24 senses. And I like to think that the sixth one, the one that they, the first one they don't teach in elementary school is the vestibular system. Uh, it's again, located in the inner ear, um, sort of behind behind the eyes, if you go straight back from your eye and in from your ear uh, is your vestibular system, which is this little structure right here. It's kind of in the inner ear. Uh, there's sort of two main parts, but five total sense organs. So there's three of these semi canals, and that's what these, these loopy structures are here. Um, and I'll show, show you how they, they uh, function on the next slide. But basically, they can sense angular velocity in all three dimensions by having these three roughly orthogonal loop, loopy structures. Uh, and then you have two otolith organs, the utricle and the tacule. And for today, I won't go too much into the details of what the, the nuance difference between those two. But those enable you also to sense uh, linear acceleration and gravity in three dimensions. And you actually have two vestibular systems, one in each ear. So if you have damage to one side, actually, your brain's pretty good at compensating and being able to 
to use the other vestibular system in the other ear. That's a normal function. Your ER brain actually integrates cues from both sides, uh, sort of, an, I guess, to some extent, analogous to having you know, two eyeballs or two ears. Um, so this is, you know, at a very high level how these sensors work. Uh, the exterior semisphere canals, when I rotate my head, I feel like this to, to match this image. The fluid inside this loopy structure is called the endolymph, and it obviously has inertia, uh, rotational inertia. And so when you rotate your head, the fluid wants to stay still in inertial space, which means it rotates in the opposite direction relative to your head. And when it gets thrown sort of around this circle, it pushes on this thing that uh, it sort of uh, blocks in between here. It's called the, the cupula. Um, and when you get that pressure on the cupula, the cupula deflects. There's hair cells that stick up into the cupula. Those hair cells get deflected, and that affects the firing rate. So if you rotate your head one way, uh, it changes the firing rate of these, these vestibular afferent neurons. To, there's a, the neurons normally fire at some standard resting discharge, a little bit less than 100 spikes per second. And when you push that on that cupula, it'll either increase or decrease the firing rate, which lets your brain, you know, be able to sense that your head has rotated and how fast it's rotating, what direction it rotates. It's a pretty cool, cool little sensory system. This is a, an image here in a frog of a, a semi-sigur canal. Um, the otoliths over here, when you tilt your head um, or translate linear acceleration, um, the utricles and the saccules sense that. And the way that they work um, is they're basically a sort of a, you can think of them as a, a platform, a flat platform. They've got a bunch of these little otoconia on top. They're little like stone, calcium stone things. This is a scanning electron microscope uh, imaging of them. They have these kind of cool, interesting shapes. They have some mass to them. And when you tilt your head back, that mass gets pulled. Um, the mass sits on top of this uh, gelatinous membrane. The membrane can sort of flop over. This is like if you put a lot of heavy things on top of a cake and then like tilted the cake, the cake starts to slide to the side, right? Um, and there's um, uh, hair cells that stick up into that. Um, and obviously when you deflect, well, Similar to the semi canals, when you deflect them, it changes the firing rate. So that's kind of how the vestibular system works. Those are your two sensors. Um, again, they're in your inner ear, and they sense angular velocity for the semi canals and uh, linear acceleration and gravity for the OLS. Okay. Any questions on that? Is that? Has anyone even heard of the vestibular system? The vestibular system is, you know, it's in your inner ear. You can't see it, right? So unlike your other senses, eyes, ears, nodes. Hold on, let me. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, those other sensors that you can see, it's like, it's maybe not as obvious. And, you know, in everyday life, you would never notice the vestibular system. If it works fine, it's great. It's really only when you have a problem with your vestibular system that you're like, oh, there, you know, that there, there's something wrong here. Whether you have vertigo or you have some type of uh, dizziness, that's usually due to your vestibular system. Uh, Zoom me out here. All right, I'll go to the, the next slide. So um, what I'm going to talk about the rest of today is kind of a creative way to artificially stimulate your vestibular system. So again, normally the vestibular system responds to physical inertial motion, right? I have to move, I have to tilt, um, I have to rotate. That's what stimulates the vestibular system, right? Um, an alternative approach is what's called the galvanic vestibular stimulation or GVS. And the idea here is basically to apply electrical stimulation usually to the mastoids right behind the ear, so you're pretty close to the vestibular system, but you know, an anode on one side, cathode on the other side, and what you can get is current flowing through, and instead of physically stimulating the vestibular system, you are just applying electricity that's gonna cause those afferent neurons to fire differently than they normally would. Um, and since the vestibular system is normally triggered by physical motion, uh, when you apply GVS, it induces a sensation, even though there's not necessarily any physical motion, um, this electrical current can induce a sensation that you are physically moving, right? You can cause the person to lose it, have an illusory sensation that they're rotating or, or tilting um, when you apply GBS. And I'll sort of go through different ways this can potentially be used through the, the remainder of the talk. So the first way, and I, I ordered this like I did in the abstract, although this is maybe a little bit of a, um, I don't know, counterintuitive way to order things, but um, is going to require introducing this idea called stochastic resonance, which you may have heard of because uh, stochastic resonance happens in other physiological sensory systems, but also in other physical systems. Um, I won't go too much into the theory of this, but it's basically a nonlinear phenomenon where you add a certain amount of typically white noise. Um, and if you apply the right amount, an optimal amount of white noise, 
you can actually improve performance. And this is sort of counterintuitive. You normally think adding noise to a sensory system that's going to make things worse. Um, and in general, that is true. But if you add just a little bit and just the right amount, you can actually improve performance. And what's going on here, and I'll, I'll show you an, an example, is if you have some some signal, this might be a, a sound wave, for example. Uh, in the case of the vestibular system, it might be a physical motion. Um, and, and if that signal is pretty small, like small enough that you can't usually sense it, um, say it's below some threshold uh, such that the neurons don't fire, they don't change their firing rate. Uh, if you add a little bit of white noise on top of that signal, right, then you still have the signal, underlying signal, but now it's got this noise going on. And that noise is going to cause these peaks of the signal to now exceed that threshold and cause the neuron to fire when it otherwise would not have. So it sort of enables you to sense things that you might not otherwise have been able to sense. At least the conceptual uh, theoretical explanation for what's going on with stochastic resonance. Um, so this has been shown to work pretty well in, in various sensory systems. Uh, benefits from stochastic resonance uh, have been shown in visual and auditory and tactile. And today I'll talk uh, about vestibular. So one of the key parts here is applying the right amount of white noise, right? If you apply no noise, you might have some perceptual threshold. So this might be, I can sense a certain motion. If it's smaller than that, it's difficult for me to sense. Um, and if I apply no white noise, that your, you know, your perceptual, vestibular perceptual threshold will be whatever it is. If we apply a little bit of noise, at some point you start to get this resonance effect and that can actually cause the perceptual threshold to improve, right? Lower thresholds mean I can sense a smaller motion, which would be better, your better perception. So you could sort of improve perception up until some optimal noise level. And then if you keep adding noise at some point, right, the noise is just gonna drown out the signal and you're just gonna have all noise and you won't be able to sense things very well. So that's what you sort of get this degraded effect as you add too much noise. A key sort of theoretical part of stochastic resonance uh, in at least experimental stochastic resonance is that different subjects might have a different optimal noise level. Potentially even different people, you know, same people on different days or at different time points um, might have different noise levels. So one person's optimal level might be at this, whatever I drew out here, this, this optimal level. But another person, if you tested them at that same level, you might see no improvement, right? Because their optimal noise level happens to be up there. This makes sort of searching for stochastic resonance almost sort of like searching for a needle in a haystack. It's, you know, you, you never know you, it's there until you find the needle in the haystack. Um, and this, it's extra challenging because usually the way that we, we look for stochastic resonance, if we don't know where that optimal level is, is to pick a bunch of different levels and measure perceptual thresholds when we apply, you know, very, very little noise, a little bit more noise, a little bit more noise, a little bit more noise, a lot of noise. Um, the problem is, of course, every time we measure a perceptual threshold, you know, like any other measurement, it in itself has some measurement variability to it. And so, you know, if this is the underlying threshold, this one might be a little less than whatever the underlying thing is, this one might be a little higher and so forth. And of course, I picked these examples because if you were to stare at that data and you didn't have the underlying curve, which of course in the real world, you never know what the underlying curve is, uh, you know, that kind of looks like a flat line, meaning there's no, no stochastic resonance. I apply white noise and it had no effect whatsoever. Um, so this becomes sort of a, a um, you know, a sort of challenge empirically to observe stochastic resonance uh, and also to convince yourself that when you are seeing stochastic resonance, that it's not just a false positive, right? Because if you really are excited about trying to see the benefits of stochastic resonance, it can be easy to stare at a data set and be like, yeah, I see a little dip here. I think there's a dip, um, but, but that might just have been by random chance. So I'll come back to that later. We've developed uh, some approaches to hopefully identify that a little bit uh, more objectively. Um, so I, I mentioned that Stochastic resonance benefits have been shown in auditory and visual and tactile sensory channels as well as others. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, trying to see this in the vestibular system by applying uh, noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. So in this scenario, um, the person is physically moved a small amount, like in this data I'll show you, they're tilted to the side, either to the left or to the right. And while they're doing this very small, you know, trying to perceive these very small tilts, we're gonna apply a very low level current to their mastoids behind their ears, hoping that that current is going to resonate with the physical motion and make it easier to perceive the physical motion. So here's sort of the, the, the electrical waveform, uh, the noisy waveform that we use. And remember, we're trying to observe something like this. We apply different uh, electrical magnitudes of electrical white noise, and we're hoping that at some level, vestibular perceptual threshold is going to go down, meaning that they can sense smaller motions than they otherwise would. 
Um, and in fact, this is what we were able to actually observe. This is one particular subject to so their threshold um, when we don't apply any white noise. So this is just a sham presentation. They, they still wear all the hardware. We just play no electrical current um, is at this level. But when we apply the right amount of electrical current, you get this dip that then sort of gradually comes back up. We're pretty excited to see this. We've now observed this in a bunch of different people. Um, this is each different line here is a different subject at different, uh, again, uh, levels of white noise that we've applied. To be perfectly honest, some people don't seem to exhibit stochastic resonance. That's what these dotted lines are shown. But even across those individuals, the gray and the black line show the average across them. So it does seem that there's sort of some, some level where there is a little bit of a dip. Um, we wanted to not just sort of see you know, if there a dip and how big of a dip is that, but we also um, wanted to sort of characterize, do they exhibit stochastic resonance or not? As I mentioned, you know, that is a, a slippery slope where you can either have false positives um, or potentially you could miss cases where there is stochastic resonance uh, and you're not, not uh, pro properly observing it. So to do that, and I won't go into all the details of this, but we um, created some simulated data, either that had no underlying stochastic resonance, a little bit of stochastic resonance benefits, meaning this dip was sort of very shallow. And then what we call strong stochastic resonance, where this dip was pretty prominent. Uh, we simulate some measurement data given the measurement uncertainty, and then we have these blinded judges guess whether each data set has stochastic resonance or not. And in and amongst the simulated data, we interleave our experimental subject data in a way that's you know, plotted the same way, so that uh, the judges can't tell whether it's experimental, whether there's you know whether it had no underlying SR weak or strong underlying SR. Uh, and they just have to say, does, do you think this exhibits SR? And as you might expect, when um, you know, they're strong underlying SR, most of the time they correctly identify based upon the simulated data that there was underlying SR. Um, interestingly, when there's no underlying SR, and this is important, people still thought there was underlying SR, not a ton of times, but you know, in the neighborhood of 15 to 40% of the time. So these are all false positives, right? This is simulated data. We know that there's no underlying SR. And yet these blinded judges thought there was underlying. So this provides sort of a nice comparison as a, a control group to our experimental subjects. And fortunately, our experimental subjects were quite a bit different than this uh, sim, uh, simulations with no underlying SR in that, in that they uh, were categorized as exhibiting a fair amount of SR. Um, so it's not quite as much as the strong, but you know, definitely there's something going on here where the experimental subjects have some underlying SR. Um, I guess I should have mentioned SR is our little acronym for stochastic residence. Um, so this was showing, I think for the first time, uh, benefits of applying noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation to improve vestibular perceptual threshold. So how small of a motion you can perceive, you can perceive smaller motions if you have the right amount of white noise being applied. So we would call that form of stochastic resonance in-channel stochastic resonance, meaning that we apply the white noise in the vestibular channel and improves the vestibular perception because the vestibular system uh, senses self-motion. Um, there's another type of stochastic resonance called cross-modal or cross-channel stochastic resonance. Uh, and this is a pretty fascinating concept. The, the idea is that we could apply noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation and actually improve perceptual thresholds in other sensory modalities. So the first thing that we looked at was visual perceptual thresholds. So this is a task, and you, you might have to get really close to the computer screen to see this, but in one of these, it's just pure static noise. And in this one over here, there's there's a little, very fine uh, grading for vertical lines. And the subject's task is to say whether the first presentation or the second presentation has the vertical gradings. And which one it's in is randomized and, oops, and the display is a certain fixed distance away from this. They can't, they can't cheat and look really close to the monitor to see, uh, to see where it's at. Um, but we can measure how much of a visual grading, how much visual contrast there is um, for them to be able to reliably perceive that visual cue. So same as before, we would do this with a sham presentation where the, the noisy galvanic vestibular simulation, the hardware is on, but we're playing no current. And then we, we apply different levels of current, increasing the current level. What we found is that indeed there was sort of this dip going on, right? It, it, they seem to have this improvement in the performance that then would sort of come back up when you apply too much noise. Um, and in this particular study, we, we took an approach where um, because we, we thought every subject might have a different best level of noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. We first sort of test, we call it a swap, a whole 10 different levels of noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. And then once we find what that subject's best level is, we'd retest that 
did an independent assessment of that, an independent assessment of the sham in a counterbalanced order. And this is data across, I think there's 10 different subjects here. What we found is that sort of the average threshold in the sham improved when they had their subject specific best, is what the B stands for, best noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. Um, that's pretty cool. We're like, okay, like that we can actually improve visual people's visual thresholds by applying noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. Certainly, I, I was a little skeptical of this. Um, you know, how could this possibly be occurring? And the, the sort of working theory that others have proposed that we've built upon is that there's multi-sensory neurons that integrate visual and vestibular information, more central neurons that sort of combine those sources of information. And if you're applying white noise to the vestibular system, those vestibular afferents have that white noise sort of resonating in them that get passed, passed, up, passed upstream and eventually resonates in those multimodal neurons that are also getting uh, sensory input from the visual system. So maybe that's the site of this stochastic resonance. Um, we've since shown actually that we can get uh, benefits, stochastic resonance benefits um, in the auditory system and the tactile system as well as the visual system by applying noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. And since Sage is on here, this is uh, Sage has done a lot of a lot of this work as, as one of our grad students uh, who uh, did a lot of these experiments. So that's all uh, in perception. Uh, you might want to ask, okay, that's great, but you know, my everyday life, do I care if I can perceive a little bit smaller motion? Um, and maybe you probably don't. You probably care about whether you can improve. Uh, some functional performance. So different people have looked at different tasks. People have looked at balance tasks. And what I'll talk about today is a uh, functional mobility task. So in this task, the person starts seated, they stand up, they have to walk across this balance beam and they have to like step over some things, duck up under some things and wander through, they have to like sort of swallow them through these, these, uh, these obstacles, walk up some stairs, walk down the stairs and go back through the course. And we time the amount of time that it takes them to go from sitting here, going through the whole course and coming back. And the thought being that if they can go through this faster, um, that suggests that they're sort of better at doing this task. And we want to see whether applying noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation can improve their ability to do this task. Um, and actually, we looked at sort of one step beyond just performance. We actually looked at learning in this task. Um, so we had subjects do this task, uh, I think, 12 different times, one after another. Um, and when they first start to do the task, they're you know, pretty slow and hesitant. They're figuring it out. They're sort of developing maybe some type of strategy. Uh, so they're pretty slow at going through this. But when they do it the second, third, fourth, fifth, et cetera, times, they, they learn and they get faster and faster at this task. And you know, this is probably because it's a pretty challenging task. You have to develop a strategy. You have to sort of calibrate how quickly you can go through uh, without hitting any of the obstacles because you get time penalties for hitting the obstacles. Uh, but by the end of the learning phase, you know, they've learned how quickly they can do this and we can quantify the change in their performance from the beginning to the end. Uh, and then we actually, uh, as I'll show you here, we would either apply the noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation during this phase, a sham presentation where there's no noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation, or we used a um, uh, what we call high level galvanic vestibular stimulation. So this was a large level of currents, uh, not necessarily noisy, but like a, a pseudo pseudo random sum of signs sort of that would sort of uh, sort of destabilize you. Um, and we're interested in uh, also using that as control. And the thought was actually that maybe um, this would be like serve as a, uh, this would be like swinging the baseball bat with the, the heavy weight on it before you go up to the plate that like if you trained with it being harder, that then when we stop it, which all of the subjects we stopped right here, so we turned off the GBS if it was on, looked at sort of the retention phase or the after effect phase. Um, once we we stop moving them, or sorry, stop the galvanic vestibular stimulation. Um, sorry, one second here. All right. Um, so this is just one example of subjects. You learn at this task. We then turn the GBS off, and we look at how how your performance is sort of retained, or what your performance is after the GBS turns off. Um, and I guess I should have mentioned this is sort of the the setup. We wanted to make this challenge task pretty challenging, so they wore these. They're actually like swim goggles to create a visually degraded scene. Uh, and then again, they, they walk on this, this uh, it's a, like a, a non-compliant a surface. Um, so they, you know, as they step, it sort of moves under you. It's kind of like a, a foam pad, um, which makes it sort of extra challenging because you can't rely upon your proprioceptive cues. So we looked at how much they could learn, um, which is what's shown on this left graph. How, how much could they go from their first trial to their last trial? And we did this uh, in a group of subjects that had the sham presentation, so no current being applied, 
and GVS and high GVS, we found actually that the, the people that had uh, noisy galvanic and similar stimulation learned more. They were able to get better at this task across the fixed 12 trials than the sham group. Um, the sham group still learned, just not as much as the noisy galvanic and similar stimulation group. Uh, and then the high GVS group was, was also sort of similar to sham. Um, they were able to learn, but not, not quite as much. Uh, and then we also just looked at the raw performance uh, at the end of the learning phase, like where did they end up down here? And also there were trends that the NGVS group outperformed the sham group by the end of their training and were statistically better than the high GVS group. So this is cool. This, this suggests that, you know, if you are given uh, noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation, maybe that sort of increased information throughput can help you learn a sensory motor task. I should get better at this, right? So Imagine applications for like athletes, right? That this would be a cool way to get better at a sport quickly uh, by, by getting increased sensory information. Uh, of course, if that task is dependent upon your vestibular system. So now I'm gonna sort of transition uh, to different applications of, of GVS. So, so far I've talked about noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. So a white noise profile, but you could apply different waveforms. Uh, in this study, um, uh, outside of our research group, they applied uh, just direct current stimulation. So they apply, um, you know, just a step in, in GVS. And then what they were looking at here was a postural response. So if we apply this current, stimulate your vestibular system, what they found is that people, their vestibular, people would have their vestibular system sense that sort of unexpected uh, current, unexpected stimulation to their vestibular system. And they would sort of like make a postural response to try to counteract that. And they could quantify how big that postural response was based upon the magnitude of the current. Um, and there's, they were also the, able to capture sort of the dynamics of this. So what they found is the postural response would have sort of an initial jump and then sort of a slow build over. Um, I think this was over like 10 seconds or so. And then when they turn it off, there was sort of this, this response of coming back to upright. So this is sort of a, again, sort of a reflex response uh, from applying a direct current stimulation to the vestibular system. People have uh, also looked at applying uh, direct current GVS and looked at people's perception of motion. So this, in this case, their, their head is fixed. They're not able to make a postural response, but when they apply either one milliamp, two milliamp, negative one, negative two milliamps, they can measure their perception using this, uh, it's called a subjective visual vertical task. Um, I won't go too much into the details, but it's a psychophysical task where you try to align this bar, uh, visual bar, uh, and it's a way to sort of have them continuously report their perception of tilt. <clears throat> and what they found is, indeed, you can cause people to feel like they're tilted, in this case, when they're not actually tilted. Their head is restrained, they're upright, they're seated, um, but we're applying GVS, and it makes them feel like they're tilted, and they feel more tilted at higher magnitudes of current flow, and you can actually make them feel like they're tilted either positive or negative, depending upon the direction of the current flow. So this is sort of a, the effect of the GVS on tilt perception. So this was, you know, we thought this was pretty, pretty interesting. You can make people feel like they're moving and feel like they're tilted when they're not actually being tilted. So what can we do with that? Um, and it sort of raised an interesting question, which is, well, in the, in, and I, I emphasize this, but just to be clear, in this study, they are, the person is fixed, right? Their head is restrained. They can't actually tilt. The only thing that's happening is applying galvanic vestibular stimulation, right? So we asked the question of, well, what if we both physically tilt them and apply galvanic vestibular stimulation. How do those two combinations, you know, this is sort of natural stimulation to your vestibular, stimulation, vestibular system, and this is this sort of unusual or abnormal stimulation to your vestibular system. Uh, what if we apply them at the same time or different combinations of those? Uh, so we did a bunch of different tilt angles between plus or minus six degrees, and uh, we're working on a bunch of different uh, direct current GBS. Uh, stimulations between plus or minus 1.5 milliamps, including zero milliamps. So that would be the case where they're, they're just physically tilted. There's no GVS. We also did the reverse, right, where we uh, left them upright and we have them uh, get different current levels. And the, the tilt is roll tilt, so that they're seated in this chair. Um, this is in our, we have a device called our tilt translation slide where we can tilt them to the left or the right while they're getting galvanic vestibular stimulation, which you can't really see. It's back here behind the headrest. And then they report their perception using this uh, haptic bar. They align this bar with where they think horizontal is, and that is measured by a potentiometer. So this is very preliminary pilot data. Uh, definitely don't draw any strong conclusions from this. We're, we're just starting uh, a more extensive data collection. Um, but there's a few takeaways here. First of all, as you might expect, when you, on the x-axis is actual physical tilt. If you tilt people, it's negative direction is to the left. If you tilt them to the left, 
They feel like they're tilted to the left, tilted to the right. They feel like they're tilted to the right, relatively proportional to the actual physical tilt. But what's interesting is the different colors correspond to different GBS currents that are applied while we've tilted them. And you can start to squint at this, uh, at least I squinted at this and said, if we apply the 1.5 milliamps, the positive current level in this maroon line, it tends to draw the perception sort of down on this curve. And similarly, if you look at the, the positive or negative 1.5 milliamps in the, in the blue line, it tends to shift this line up. So what you're doing is whatever their tilt perception is, you can sort of modulate it. You can cause them to perceive like they're tilted more to the left or more to the right, depending upon the direction of current flow. And of course, there's a magic point here in between where, for example, you know, it, looking at this blue line, you might physically be tilted to the left. But if we apply the right amount of current looking at this blue line, negative 1 1.5 milliamps, you can make them feel like they're actually upright. So they're physically being tilted. They feel like they're, they're still upright. They, they didn't move. Um, and this is interesting or exciting because you could imagine uh, you know, applications where you have to move, but you don't want to move or you don't want to feel like you're moving. So riding in a car, an airplane, or a boat, you physically move. You don't have a choice because the vehicle is moving, and that leads to motion sickness. If we could apply this to sort of cancel out, the, uh, the perception of motion, then presumably you might be able to reduce or mitigate motion sickness. All right, so the, the last uh, sort of application that we've been exploring that I'll, I'll, I'll chat through, and then certainly we can, we can discuss questions, and, and I if you have questions now, feel free to interrupt, I guess, but um, is thinking about using GDS as actually a display modality. So um, in an aerospace department uh, and in, in our aerospace department, think a lot about how we can convey information to operators. So this is inside of a, a aircraft cockpit. There is a ton of information, right? A lot of that information is displayed visually, right? There's a lot of these, well, these days, mostly LCD screens um, showing information to the pilot of the aircraft, um, particularly for alarms. There's a lot of auditory displays, right? This alarm goes off, there's something going on. This even happens, you know, in a car, right? When you drive a car, you're looking at the, down at the speedometer, you're looking at the amount of gas that's left in your gas tank. Um, but then when a car, uh, when, you know, when you're swerving into a lane, uh, another car might honk at you, right? That's an auditory display. If you have a new car, it might beep at you that you're, you know, diverging from the lane. Um, but critically, a, a lot, if not all of that information is being displayed to people in their visual and their auditory display or, uh, mode, sensory modalities. And what that sort of leads to is an over uh, burden on those particular display modalities. So there's a big, big push to try to come up with alternative display modalities. And this is based upon this concept called uh, information processing theory that if you display information on say different display modalities, you can actually just convey more information in sort of the same fixed amount of time. And this is true, you know, even with visual and auditory displays, if you're sitting on the couch and watching TV, getting a lot of visual information. If you hear the microwave beep, that's an auditory display to tell you that the microwave is beeping. If you if your microwave only gave you a visual display, like showed some flashing light, you would never see that because you're watching the TV, right? So the advantage here is you can leverage these different sensory modalities to get more information throughput. And so people have done this with tactile, um, right? They have these like belts that will vibrate and tell you information about things around you, um, obviously both visual and auditory. So we asked, could you use galvanic vestibular stimulation to use your vestibular system as an alternative display modality? This is kind of an out there weird idea, um, but <laughs> it might be cool to explore. Um, and the first question that you might want to ask is, well, hold on a second. You told me the vestibular system senses self-motion and that I can cause people to lose their balance or to have this postural response if you apply high levels of GBS. Uh, so isn't this just going to make people fall over? Like you, you don't want when your microwave alarm goes off for you to fall over to know that you need to go check the microwave, right? Um, so we, we asked, you know, does applying a GPS cue cause imbalance or instability? Um, and as I'll show you, we, we came up with a um, way to apply the GPS um, where we use a, a pretty high or a moderately high um, frequency sinusoid. Um, and that, that, that particular type of stimulation sort of we found that the brain seems to interpret that. It, it's not a stimulation you could really ever experience in everyday life. Um, we apply at least 10 hertz, usually up to 50 hertz, and there's really no way to like shake your head at 50 hertz, right? So it's, it's sort of an unnatural stimulation, and we found that the brain tends to sort of sense that, but not feel like it's really self-motion. My best description of it is it feels like, um, almost like there's 
there's like a tapping, but with no motion. It's like you feel you feel the sensation, but you're not going anywhere. Um, and I'll sort of show some results where we explored whether that is able to avoid causing imbalance. Uh, and then we wanted to ask the obvious question is, okay, if, if you don't cause people to fall over, um, can people actually perceive differences between these GDS cues, right? If you, you need to convey information, you need people to be able to tell whether it's the microwave alarm that's going off or the doorbell ringing, right? They have to be able to sense at least two or more dis discrete or different types of cues in order for it to be a uh, useful display modality. Uh, and then the final thing, and this is largely because, uh, so the DARPA funded project and DARPA wanted to think about like, could this be used out in the field? Is, is GVS as a display modality robust to different environments? So uh, I'll, I'll sort of talk through that in a second. So this is the, the task that we had subjects do. Um, we first gave them um, a one particular frequency of GVS cues. In this case, we picked 50 Hertz. Um, and this is what we call a pedestal. So it's basically the cue that you're going to compare to. You, you, you experience it. And then right after that cue, we apply another cue. And that cue is either a higher frequency or a lower frequency. And your task is to try to distinguish whether the GBS uh, sinusoidal waveform was the lower frequency or the higher frequency. And you can imagine that as the pink one and the red one get sort of more and more similar to the blue one, this becomes a difficult task. Right? At some point, you won't be able to tell is it a lower frequency or a higher frequency in the second uh, interval of this test. Um, so the first cue is again, always 50 Hertz, that's the pedestal. Uh, and these all of our cues were one second duration and 0.6 milliamps, so pretty comfortable. Um, and we would apply the second cue anywhere between 10 and 90 Hertz. We actually used a, a um, adaptive staircase to pick, to pick what that stimulus is. Um, and, what we found is that yes, people were able to effectively distinguish between um, whether the second cue was a higher frequency or a lower frequency. And this is called a just noticeable difference threshold or J and D. And we found that the average just noticeable difference is about uh, plus or minus 12 Hertz. So if we manipulate the second cue to be say 12 Hertz higher than 50 Hertz, so like 62 Hertz or 12 Hertz lower, so like 38 Hertz, then you could pretty reliably be able to tell whether the second cue is lower or higher frequency. And, you know. At a high level, this suggests that you could tell the doorbell from the microwave alarm, right? Um, that if you picked these different GBS uh, waveform frequencies, you could make, you know, a cue that might tell an operator they need to go back to base or they need to go find their uh, their partner or something like that. So we tested this in a bunch of different people, um, and we also tested in these different environments. So we had them do this while they were either seated or standing or walking. Um, we had them. Um, Again, DARPA was interested in, could you do use this in a moving vehicle? So we used our little tilting uh, um, device, our, our tilt translation sled device. Um, we either had them moving in that device or we had them stationary in that device. And we have a sound booth where we could also test whether uh, this was robust to them being in a quiet environment or a loud environment. And the sort of high level takeaways is definitely there's some individual differences, each of the lines of different subject. Um, but in general, people were able to perceive between the two different cues and that the, the differences uh, were pretty robust to the different postural moving or loud conditions. I mean, if you didn't see any statistical difference between those conditions. So this you know, suggests that GBS cues could reliably be perceived. They're not maybe the most precise cueing, um, but that you could at least distinguish between a handful of different GBS cues. So the second question was, you know, is this gonna cause people to fall over? Um, are, are GBS cues destabilizing? So what we did for this is we had them do a series of different um, balance tests. We used something called a modified Romberg balance test. You basically stand with your arms crossed. You either do it with your eyes open on a firm surface, eyes closed, or instead of a firm surface, you stand on a foam pad, which reduces uh, the proprioceptive cues in your ankle. You do that when eyes open or closed. I won't show the data for that because in, in brief, people were able to do this, all four conditions of this task really well, whether or not they had the GVS or not. Whoops. Um, but we also had them do a, a heel to toe walking test. So this is, I don't even know if they actually do this anymore, but this is if someone gets pulled over for drunk driving, you have to do this heel to toe tandem walking test because it's very sensitive to uh, sort of dis equal disequilibrium. Um, and so we tested uh, using this test as well, um, where you do it first eyes open and then eyes closed. And here's the data for eyes closed. You, you have to take 10 steps and we measure correct steps versus incorrect steps, whether you have to like take a step to the side or your steps aren't sort of heel to toe uh, appropriately, or you have to move your arms to, to save your balance. 
Um, and in the case with no GBS, the sham condition, you know, they might lose or might make one or two or three missteps uh, out of the 10. And you see a similar number, whether we apply a 50 hertz GBS uh, waveform or the 10 hertz we found to be, um, we thought might be more uh, destabilizing and this is sort of closer to being a more natural frequency. Uh, and again, we found no difference. So this suggests that it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not overly destabilizing and that you could uh, provide information on that sensory channel. All right, so I'll, I'll wrap up now so we can get to questions. Um, so just to summarize here, we've been exploring uh, galvanic precision simulation and potential uses of it. Uh, I showed some results that suggest NGVS can induce stochastic resonance benefits, um, improving roll tail perception and learning of functional abilities, so both sort of perception and action uh, within the vestibular channel, so in-channel stochastic resonance, but also cross-modal stochastic resonance, um, such as the visual channel. And, you know, there's obvious applications here. This could be useful for high performers where you need really high performance of your vestibular system. So firefighters or soldiers, or also maybe individuals that otherwise have really poor performance. So clinical populations like elderly individuals oftentimes lose their balance and fall. Could we use that? Uh, could we use noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation to improve or sort of recover their balance? It can also be used to alter a sense of self motion during a physical motion. So potentially even you know, adding to a physical motion, but could also be used to cancel out a, a, a physical self motion. And that might be used to reduce motion sickness. And then finally, we've been playing around with GDS as an alternative display modality to the common visual and auditory display modalities. And that seems to be pretty robust across uh, environments and non double negative here, but non destabilizing doesn't stabilize you, but it hopefully does not cause you to be destabilized. Um, so I will stop there. Oh, actually, sorry. I, I really do actually want to mention this. I was going, I added one last slide last minute because I do really want to be uh, sort of forward about some limitations. It's, I don't know, sounds exciting and fun that you could make people perceive whatever you want them to perceive. But there are some real limitations. Um, so you're remember, it's important to remember you're applying current uh, to their mastoids. And that current flows through and causes those vestibular afferent neurons to fire. It seems to cause uh, both the semi canal and the otolith afferent neurons to fire. And it does so in, I would say, an unnatural stimulation pattern. When we tilt our heads, right, you're getting a certain amount of rotational cues and an amount of stimulation to your otoliths. And there's sort of a profile to that. They're coupled over time. Uh, you can, when you apply, you know, GBS current, that current just like blasts away, right? It, it's not like, in a naturalistic way that you would normally move your head. Uh, once that current goes into your head, you have, you know, we as the experimenters have essentially no control of where that current goes. It goes in the path of least resistance. By putting the electrodes really close to our vestibular system, it'll go through the vestibular system, but like you can't like decide you want to stimulate one semicircular canal and not the other, right? It's going to just go through and affect all, all of the vestibular system. Um, NGVS is really exciting. It, you know, if there's some magical way to improve my perception, that sounds great, but these effects are not like making me three times better. They don't make you into a superhuman. Um, they seem to be relatively small. The improvements, you know, usually in the order of about a 30% improvement. Some people maybe a little bit more, but in that neighborhood. Um, it also, for the most part, we found that you need to personalize that off the level. So I couldn't just like off the shelf sell this to someone and they would just use the same level that everybody else with it, we have to optimize that. And we actually don't know a ton about sort of what you know, determines the optimal level um, and how you might go about finding that. Um, and there's also some evidence, uh, certainly other papers have suggested that some people just don't exhibit stochastic resonance with noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. For whatever reason, they're just immune to this. Uh, so it might not work for everybody, but um, you know, if I was an astronaut landing on the moon, I would care a lot about 30% improvement, right? I'd want anything I could possibly do to be uh, optimized. So. Maybe there's some applications. The other thing I mentioned is, or, or didn't really touch on, is is there's you're applying current uh, being the, via these electrodes that you put on your skin. You can't just apply any current you want, right? At some point, this becomes pretty painful. Um, all of the things that I mentioned today, uh, particularly the, the noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation, is very low level. In many of these cases, it's you don't even notice that it's on, right? The sham, you you wouldn't be able to tell whether you have the sham or the the certain amount of of noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. In the, some of the studies where we try to affect their perception, we use larger amplitudes, you know, up to maybe two milliamps. This is still pretty small, um, definitely tolerable, maybe a little bit of, I call it like tingling or itching on the skin. It's not really painful, but it, you can definitely know that the current is on. Um, and that doesn't 
cause you to feel like you're upside down. It doesn't cause you know you to be able to remove gravity. Um, you're not gonna be able to like recreate gravity in spaceflight doing this. Um, so you know maybe it will make you feel like you're tilting a few, maybe several degrees is maybe what we're anticipating seeing with current levels that are tolerable to apply to the skin. Um, I'll maybe just put one caveat on this, which is I do think applying any um, you know, inducing any amount of sensation emotion might be beneficial, right? If if your boat is rocking back and forth at 15 degrees and I can only cancel out 10 degrees of that, I'd rather feel like I'm only moving back and forth five degrees in terms of my motion sickness than 15 degrees. So it might not be perfect, but you know, in terms of mitigating things like motion sickness, it might be beneficial. And then I, I didn't really touch too much on this, but um, when we, we call it bilateral GBS with the electrodes on the mastoids behind the ears, that predominantly induces a sensation of roll tilt. Um, there's no sort of, uh, you know, with just those two electrodes, there's no like magic way to make people feel like they're pitching or really yawing substantially. Um, some, some other research groups have proposed using basically a different montage of electrodes, many different electrodes, potentially synced, uh, you know, where you're applying, if you have four electrodes, say two on the forehead, two behind the ears, and the current flow sort of if you have a sinusoid between what's the anode and the cathode, you could sync these things, and they suggest that you might be able to, to induce a sensation of, of yaw as well as potentially pitch. Um, it's a little tricky because, as I mentioned, once that current goes in your head, right, it's going to go the path of least resistance. You know that the amount going in is the amount going out, but where it flows within the head, you have no control over it. Right? You know, they draw these current paths, but my guess is the current comes in and goes wherever it wants to go to get out, right? Um, just again, based upon the path of least resistance. So we've actually uh, built and developed a uh, five electrode GBS system. So we're, we're starting to initiate some tests to sort of see what montages could be possibly used to induce these, these perceptions in different axes. So for now, with two electrodes, it's really a, a roll tilt perception, just you know, tilt into the left or tilt into the right. So now with that, I will stop talking and happy to answer any questions. I have something. Um, so I do virtual reality stuff. So my first thought is, can we use this to help people sense virtual environments? Like if you're on a boat in VR, can you use GVS to make you feel like you're wobbling back and forth when you're not really? Absolutely right. In, in VR, right, you have a visual scene that maybe moving, you know, you're riding the roller coaster in VR, really a strong visual scene you're moving. Your similar system is saying, nope, I'm not moving at all. And that's really what leads to cyber sickness, right? And, and, and they, you know, sort of a challenge of VR is you can only do it for so long and then you start to feel pretty nauseous. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, I, people have sort of proposed this. I'm actually not aware of anyone who's, who's successfully set up a system where the virtual reality uh, and, the, and the GBS are synced together. Um, we have our, a system that does tactile cues um, you can put pressure on the side of people to make them feel like they're tilting, um, and that is synced with our galvanic vestibular simulation. But yes, I would be happy to chat with you about, about that. We have some VR systems here. We just haven't put the effort in to get those things synced. That'd be that'd be pretty interesting. And I, you know, to this point, I am a somewhat confident that even if you can't feel like you're riding a roller coaster with GBS, if you just get it in the right direction and the timing right, your brain will take those cues and kind of like mesh them together, right? As long as you think that there's a common source of the stimulation across your sensory uh, sensory systems, you know, it's, it's, it'll want to integrate them and you might be able to, you know, induce a sensation that's pretty strong, like like riding a roller coaster um, that has, you know, even if the GBS can't quite really get to that level. Cool. I would be very interested in looking into that some more. So I'll sure. send you an email. Okay. The long-term effects of this, both if you can get the NGBS uh, over the period of minutes, hours, or longer, and then also over days, weeks, months, whether it's continuous or whether you come back later, does it persist or does it fade? Uh, I would say this is largely an open research question and I think a really important one. Um, I could comment on a few things. I think the longest anyone has used this continuously like eight hours right and the, the, the issue is you know just like battery packs moving around etc it's sort of a, a little bit difficult to take out of the lab not possible but a little bit difficult um 
on our side, we've done a study where subjects wear it for basically an hour each day, and they did this task, and they would come back every day for five days in a row. Um, and we found, you know, basically that the effects were very similar over time, that there didn't seem to have any real changes there. Um, and we did a bunch of, this was like a NASA study, so they were interested in like, is this going to have psychological effects on the astronauts that might use this? So we did a bunch of, uh, of psychological well-being assessments, and we didn't see anything on, on that front that seemed to have either benefits or, or problems of using it, you know, over a uh, time course of a week. Longer than that really hasn't been studied. I think that's a really important open question that, that should be investigated. Um, we, I didn't show this data, uh, I wasn't sure how much time I'd have, but uh, we did do, th there's one study that suggests that after you turn the GBS off, you still get sustained benefits, which is kind of counterintuitive to me, like that doesn't really make sense. And their particular study had some experimental design flaws and that they were, you know, not comparing to a control group. So there could have been ordering effects. Um, in our learning assessment, we actually do see more like the performance it, because they learn better, that learning is retained. So even after we turn the GBS off, it was better to have learned with GBS in the performance after we turn the GBS off than if we had learned with sham. So it's not really performance. I mean, the metric is performance, but it's not that the, you know, it's, it's a learning effect that leads to after effect performance. So that, you know, seems promising. Like. Also a little, I've thought about this for sports a little bit. It's like, is this the next steroids? You could like train with this and that would give you, turn you into better at uh, performing, you know, playing basketball or whatever, but then you, you don't have to wear the GBS while you play basketball. It's that you practice playing basketball with the GBS. So uh, I don't know, it's probably again, slight improvements, but um, yeah, that's where we're at on, on long-term effects. Have you seen, um, or have you heard of any therapeutic uses for GVS. I'm thinking in particular for individuals with a sensory processing disorder where you're not necessarily looking to take away, but you're looking to add where vestibular simulation is calming. Mm -hmm. um, That's, I think it's a really fascinating idea. And off, at least off the top of my head, I am not aware of anything in that space. I think that'd be, be cool to explore. Uh, we have a proposal under review where we've been thinking about um, an MTBI patients. They they have balance impairments, but they also have like psychological issues of like their sense of self is disrupted because of some of the, the you know, it's more central interpretation of vestibular cues, but their sense of self can lead to uh, psychological well-being issues. And sort of our working hypothesis is that if you could use NGVS to improve their posture balance uh, type of metrics, that might also have carryover effects to psychological well-being, but not so much, I guess, from just the pure, pure stimulation. Um, I think it's interesting. You know, I think where this really has benefit is where you couldn't otherwise apply physical motion, right? Like if you could just otherwise do therapeutics by applying physical motion, that's probably a better way to do it because it's a natural stimulation. But, um, you know, if there's a case where you couldn't do that, we've thought about this for like astronauts in space flight, right? You can't tilt your head in space uh, because you, tilt, I mean, you can tilt your head, but there's no gravity. So it doesn't feel like a tilt. Uh, could we sort of induce that sense of tilting in space uh, that they would otherwise not really get to experience. Well, it's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what question I have. I think I have two different type of questions. So one is about the learning effect that carry over. Now I'm curious to find maybe people are really good at gymnastic or tight rope walking other things. And see if they have a lower or higher threshold to get to that optimal point. And the second thing is that I have seen, for example, like uh, some people in Alzheimer's disease and they even forgot how to move, but playing the right music or sound, they actually start moving and almost like they don't live at all. So I'm totally curious about how the how the GVS will be able to affect maybe how, how do we figure out how to tune for individual person to the optimal place where they either move or perceive the world. I don't know. Yeah, just, yeah um, I'll very briefly just mention about individual, like what is the optimal for individuals? It seems to be correlated with in, vest in the vestibular uh, domain and vestibular perceptual thresholds. It seems to be correlated with what a person's natural vestibular perceptual threshold is without GBS. So people that have higher noise levels um, can tend to benefit more from the noisy galvanic vestibular simulation is a thought. 
Um, and it seems that the optimal level seems to be related to that as well. Uh, I really liked your comment about gymnasts. Uh, this has been a fascinating topic that I've done no research in, but I just think it's fascinating, um, which is it's been observed previously that gymnasts um, have lower vestibular perceptual thresholds. They're better at sensing motion. Of course, the million dollar question is what's the cause and what's the effect, right? Is that, do they become gymnasts because they're better at sensing motion or are they better at sensing motion because they practice gymnastics mm -hmm. all the time? Um, but who knows, really hard to, and then it's like, and so then where, did, where could uh, noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation fit into that equation? Um, who knows? Hard to recruit those subjects uh, and, you know, to do the real treatment study where you turn people into gymnasts is really hard, but it would be neat. Well, I love the example of uh, seeing the pattern of vertical. I mean, literally, I walk up to the screen, I can see it. I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I can figure out what different GBS to apply at different time when I do different tasks, I mean, like, maybe I don't need to wear glasses, and maybe I don't need to. My, my brain should be sharper. <laughs> That's, so cool. That's right. Yeah. And I guess I think Sage had a takeoff. We also did a study looking at uh, cognitive performance with a bunch of it's called the cognition test battery. There's been some previous studies that suggest that, that you know, stochastic resonance can have sort of more central effects on cognitive performance. Um, those that literature is I should mention, I guess this literature is a little questionable in many cases, you know, people are trying to find benefits. So oftentimes they will, you know, the, the methods are not as rigorous as you may hope. Uh, and this is particularly the case with the cognitive stuff. We tried pretty darn hard any different which way with cognition and couldn't see really a, a whole lot of benefits. Um, we have a little bit of an evidence of sort of a subject specific effect that people that in our questionnaires that said they preferred working in noisy environments like working in coffee shops actually tended to perform better when they were given these white noise stimuli. But you know, it's observational, so hard to tell. <laughs> Ooh. I would, but I didn't. I'm not really sure I can contextualize this appropriately. It's nice to see another torrent again. Nice to see <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. That was fascinating. I think we'll follow up about the VR experiment and yeah. other. Ah. Cool. <laughs> right, well, thank you all. Thanks thank for you. Me.